so thanks very much for the, to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'm speaking on some of the debates around uh, political responses to the um, prospect of climate breakdown. And I'm going to kick off with a few points about climate change there, the, 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 the sort of scientific stuff. <coughs> Most of you will be quite familiar with all of this. I'm going to be very, very brief on these. Um, because I think they set the scene that we're, we're going to be responding to, and then I'll move on to look at the political dilemmas concerning growth, degrowth, Green New Deal. Um, so, start with some, a couple of graphs. These uh, graphs show you um, carbon dioxide and temperature going back 400, 500,000 years or something. Um, they're from ice core samples in, taken in the coldest the coldest point on the planet, um, which, well, I grew up in Fife, I used to think it was Fife, but I, um, uh, it's actually Vostok in Antarctic, and um, you see from these uh, graphs charting CO2 and temperature, average temperature estimates over the hundreds of thousands of years, that firstly, that they're highly volatile, secondly, that they vary together. This is very well-known stuff, a bit less obvious. If you look at the end, is that the, um, the Holocene in the last 11,000 years or so um, is extraordinarily benign in terms of the temperature that we've, uh, that human beings have been, inhabit uh, have been enjoying over the last 11,000 years. It's been a, a blessed 11,000 years compared to what went before and, um, and definitely compared to what's going to come next. Um, because uh, you'll notice that the year, um, the year zero, for these graphs is actually 1950, so they give you an impression of temperature and CO2 volatility from 420,000 years ago to 1950. Um, what do you think happens next? Well, uh, when I wrote, first wrote this part of the talk about five, six years ago or something, I, um, I just drew a little line on the, my laptop to see how high it was gonna, gonna go. Um, the CO2 uh, indicator, and at that point in time, it went up to 400. Uh, we're a few years on from that now, so it's 409, I think, is the latest. It's soaring upward very, very rapidly indeed, and so this is going to obviously pull the global temperature up uh, enormously. This is where we are at the moment, um, <clears throat> and so we're heading uh, in this direction towards a uh, hothouse earth scenario barreling in that direction. Um, although there's scientists, the scientists, um, most estimates um, or most models suggest that there is, there is still a way out towards a relatively stabilized uh, scenario. Can um, I be very dumb and ask what Holocene is? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, right? There are all sorts of ge the geologists um, divide uh, the Earth's geological history in um, different periods, and the most recent one is known as the Holocene. And is it still running, or what's the answer? Well, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I should have explained this. Um, uh, the Anthropocene is, Anthropos from man or humanity, um, is a label that is increasingly being given to the era that's now opening, which is an era in which uh, humanity has the world's climate in its hands, um, uh, so to speak, uh, for better or worse, probably for worse, we'll, we'll see. Um, and some, some, there's a debate about whether it's, it's better to call it the Anthropocene or the capitalist scene after the system that is driving this um, rapid uh, uh, emissions increase. But yeah, that's the back, sorry, that's the... They're the geological terms. Um, so this could be, well, this looks to be, <coughs> these are the sorts of scenarios up ahead. Um, there's, um, if, if uh, the oil and coal companies burn all the fossil fuels, that <coughs> uh, then they would raise its average global temperatures by about 10 degrees, which is the, you're talking there just massive species of extinction, huge swathes of planet unhabitable for human beings, the great cities of the coasts all underwater. Um, and even this is a conservative estimate because it's based only on the fossil fuels that are currently known of. 
And it also, and remember there's unpredictability built into all of this because there are feedback mechanisms with the Earth's cryosphere, the, the ice on glaciers and um, uh, the poles uh, all melting and so reducing, um, uh, so, so increasing um, absorption of the sun's energy and that becomes then a feedback mechanism which then accelerates uh, climate change further and there are enormous feedback mechanisms up ahead, possibly, quite likely as well, the uh, release of massive amounts of methanes, methane, from which is uh, greenhouse gas from methane hydrates and clathrates under the oceans as the oceans warm, and so this then leads to a spiraling effect, a vicious, vicious circle effect. Um, and of course, as, as you may have spotted, this um, slide some things, sums things up very neatly about the politics of the situation in which, which we're in as well, and uh, uh, ironically, because in the foreground we have the, the, the science um, the scientific prediction that if we keep on burning all the fossil fuels, then we're headed to possibly human extinction territory. Certainly, certainly um, an insufferably difficult uh, planet to, for human beings to live on. Um, that's the scientific prediction. But then on the left, we have The Guardian, which is the woke newspaper in Britain, has woken up to um, the dangers of climate change. So we have here a banner indicating the campaigning spirit, keep it in the ground. Um, but of course, looming above, above us all is the gigantic advert for, placed in The Guardian by one of the world's biggest oil companies, the ninth biggest, I think it is. Um, and so this, this slide, in a sense, captures our, our doomed future, where the, the, you know, the liberal, uh, the, the sort of, the liberal segment of society is campaigning, um, is raising <coughs> protest against climate change, but because they're hooked into the, a system that is dominated by fossil fuel energy systems, they continue to um, take money um, and advertise for the fossil fuel companies. Um, uh, these companies which are hell-bent on discovering every last molecule of fossilized hydrocarbons and burning it and burning the planet with it, obviously, as well. Um, but then we can see a third angle to it um, as well. Hey, look, um, maybe this is the solution. Possibly, could the fossil fuel economy become a fossil itself? There's more investment it piles into renewable energies, including, uh, including from Statoil here itself. Um, so this is, a, this is an ad, another advert from Statoil, which is boasting about its investments in, in renewables. Um, unfortunately, this is um, greenwash or hogwash or some sort of wash anyway. Um, it's, a, it's a way for the big polluters to prepare themselves for the court, cry, for the court cases that are going to come their way for the public outcry as the scale of their crimes begins to become clear. And um, uh, at present, I mean, despite all this advertising uh, about wind and solar energy um, and you know there's a momentum in, in all, all these adverts they, they begin to convince us that um, renewables are actually um, are actually unstoppable um, in their ascent but actually if, if you take wind and solar and geothermal all together combined they comprise what do you think percentage of total global final energy supply? Any guesses? Below 1%. Oh, you're a cynic anymore. Um, okay, that's an unusual answer. I was, you were supposed to say uh, 10 or 20, which is what most people assume. It's actually 1.5. 1.5, so you can um, you can relax a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, 1.5 percent, almost nothing, and total energy demand globally is rising to such an extent that each new 10 megawatts of renewably generated electricity displaces at most one megawatt from fossil fuels. The other nine is additional being used. So in other words, uh, renewables are not replacing uh, fossil fuels. Um, in Scotland, the picture is, a, is quite a bit better. I mean, there's not much solar energy, I don't think, but um, uh, a lot of wind. Um, but there's still oil being pumped, and the Scottish government giving licences to uh, uh, <coughs> oil companies for drilling new fields, exploring new fields, I believe, which is absolutely scandalous, of course. Um, so as long as um, 
the oil and coal and gas are still being burnt, still being used in our cars, in our planes, etc. Even if a, even if the rate of use goes down, this graph is still going to keep rising. It's like you know, even even as we burn less, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the effects on temperature are still going to keep rising. It's like if you have a bath and you keep the, and the and the plug is in, you turn the water down a, a bit, um, it'll still keep fill, filling. And this is the key graph of the future of the planet. I think it's um, data from the uh, America's. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, uh, which is a subsidiary, I love this, it's a subsidiary agency of the Department of Commerce. So the, 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 <laughs> the atmosphere and the oceans are sort of, in a sense, regulated, owned by the Department of Trade. Um, so then the question isn't really whether emissions can be reduced. We know that they can, but can they be reduced fast enough? And what are the political solutions on offer? Well. Broadly, I mean, one of the major ones is um, is uh, green growth. Um, uh, I broke, I did some research on this about 12, 14 years ago, and um, looked at the strategies of British corporations, and they were all committed to growing their corporations but becoming greener. And the strategies they used were basically using more agrofuels or biofuels, which have it. Uh, huge downsides um, and can be made the cause of major emissions rises. Um, so that's not really um, a very hopeful one. Reducing energy use was another one, but this is something businesses uh, have to do anyway. It's something they're driven to do to lower costs. So, you know, the corporations make a big play about, you know, reducing energy use for the planet, but in fact, this is what they've had to do anyway all the time. Uh, so, there's a little bit of greenwash there as well. Um, we see a lot of token investments in renewables, uh, as I indicated on a previous graph, and a huge faith in future technological innovation. Um, when I was doing this research um, 12, 14 years ago, the, the, the classic case at the time was, um, was, uh, was this guy here. Um, and I think this slide sums up in this one image well, much of the ideology of the present. And it also resonates with ghosts from the past as well. In, in what sense the past? Well, when I look at this slide and see Virgin America, I mean, it recalls, in some respects, England's colonization of North America, which started with Virginia, the, named after the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth. Um, and the justification of that colonization was um, that the, colon the land being annexed was sort of virgin land. Uh, even the poets of the time, such as John Donne, wrote about America in this, um, in this, uh, uh, in exactly this way that um, that that we have the right to possess this virgin territory in America um, in order to make its land. Uh, increase, grow for the, for the use of men. Um, and he's, John Donne as well, the famous poet, he's, he sexualized uh, the, the images, uh, the, the image uh, talking of America as, uh, in, in his poem to his mistress going to bed, um, talking it as a, a, a new territory to be explored with delight and lust and so that's, there's a past resonance of this image, um, but more importantly, it's the present we're looking at. Um, uh, Branson, of course, an ultra-rich business owner, not coincidentally, happens to be white, pale, male and stale, or white, old white guy. Um, here he is in a, in a team with his employees, the employees who happen to be, not coincidentally, happen to be women and of diverse backgrounds. They have to smile, and you know he, oh, this guy owns their jobs and therefore their personal futures. So they have to nod along as he raves about his plans to destroy the world through expanding aviation. And they have, you know, we have to nod along with our uh, business owners as they um, uh, make these expansion plans. And Branson really does plan to destroy the world. Um, this is what this is the line that uh, 
of George Monbiot's that described Branson's um, strategy, because this is, this is a quote from Richard Branson. I can hear people saying, if carbon dioxide emissions are the problem, why doesn't Branson just stop his planes from flying? <laughs> But if we stop, we leave a gap that somebody who might have no sense of responsibility at all uh, <laughs> would fill. Um, now, where, where he's talking of sense of responsibility, what he means um, in that moment of the quote was, for instance, his investment in agrofueled flights. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, at the time, the magic technology, the 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 extraordinary invention that was going to enable planes to fly in a decarbonized way was the coconut. And um, uh, Branson uh, believed that uh, his company was going to be able to uh, uh, make, make the planes run on coconuts. Uh, coconut fuel, I mean, not, you know, you have to, I don't know, process them, boil them down, you take the oil away and put it into your planes. And, um, and so uh, there were calculations um, being uh, publicised how many coconuts this, a, a flight from London to Amsterdam was going to take. So I, I scaled it up and <laughs> calculated what it would take to supply Heathrow, just, just Heathrow Airport, for, for just for a year. And it was going to be, I can't remember the details, I, I've written them down somewhere, but it's something like, you know, all the world's coconuts to supply one airport, something like this. So it's just completely mad. Um, using technology as a ruse to convince us that um, these uh, utter um, uh, psychopaths should, should carry on um, expanding. And of course Virgin Atlantic is expanding. We, since um, we, uh, they've got rid of, uh, uh, the CEO is no longer Branson, it's this guy at the bottom, uh, I forget his name, Shea something or other. Shea Bryce. That's it. That's it. Um, uh, but of course, and this is just from a month ago, this uh, article, Virgin Atlantic reveals massive growth aspirations. And uh, as if that's not enough, well, if you have massive growth aspirations, where are you going to land all your planes? So Virgin is lobbying hard for an expansion of Heathrow Airport as well. So what I'm suggesting here is that this gives you in a pretty extreme form, admit admittedly, um, the sort of green growth um, Plan that we uh, much of which much of which is 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 greenwash. The the center of it is the argument that uh, the businesses um, who have got the world into into this mess have the power to uh, get us out of it as well. What it completely elides misses out is the systemic pressures that businesses face to continually expand. They have to expand profits on pain of uh, going under. They have to increase economies of scale, uh, expand production, expand scale of produ production, and so on. Now this sort of greenwashing is limited to big Western companies. We've, there are examples all over the world. Here's, here's one from uh, a town in Korea, New, uh, South Korea, New Songdo, which um, markets itself as a sustainable city, and the United Nations has chosen New Songo to host its Green Climate Fund. Um, and so I looked at New Songo to see, well, maybe there are some examples of real green growth uh, being enacted in innovative parts of the world with, with great technological know-how like South Korea. Um, so I looked at, I began, to, I didn't have to do a great deal of research because um, you just go onto the New Songdo website, and it says it's one of the world's greenest cities. Um, and then I looked uh, at the buttons down the left under sustainable city. Um, I, and my eye went down to the bottom of the screen. You can probably see it there. And, and there's the word uh, aerotropolis. New Songdo is an aerotropolis. I thought, what is, I've never heard this word. What is an aerotropolis? Um, well, apparently, um, it's a city built around an airport, so everyone can commute in and out uh, as much as they can. Now, again, this is an extreme example, but the, there's a lot of talk around about cities becoming green cities and combining um, uh, decarbonization of the city with growth. And um, a 
one really quite, in some respects, actually quite admirable example is Copenhagen. It's one that um, you read a lot about in The Guardian, for example, which is 100% um, behind these, the, these sorts of claims. Um, and Copenhagen has done some, you know, made, has made some major steps towards de decarbonization and deserves some applause for that. But, but the claim that this is compatible with continual growth is um, completely risible because, I mean, take Copenhagen, it declares itself to be uh, a, a green, sustainable city, but the, very luckily, the people who built the city decided to locate the airport just outside the perimeter, so the airport doesn't get counted <laughs> in, the, in the figures, and neither do all the goods coming in to feed the growing demand, because as, a, as GDP grows, demand grows, and demand for goods grows. Those goods don't count, get counted either. Um, so by these um, ruses, um, uh, you, can, you can pretend an awful lot about um, uh, green growth that actually isn't, um, is again, uh, a, contains a, an awful lot of greenwash. And I, just very briefly, another classic example is, I, I went to Gatwick Airport and was stunned to see uh, these signs all over the place. Gatwick Airport is plastered with these um, uh, with these declarations that Gatwick Airport is carbon neutral. I thought maybe the planes here fly by magic somehow, um, but of course no. The airport defines itself only as the airport itself, and not as the planes that land there or take off. And um, so, so long as the airport then buys its electricity from power companies. Uh, and so, again, this is just a, one of many examples where you really can't trust any of this at all. As soon as you look at any of it, uh, as soon as you scratch the green surface, it just flakes off. Um, so, obviously, our trust can't be placed in the corporate sector. Uh, it's no surprise their solutions are largely greenwash, um, despite some you know, impressive initiatives here and there. Their imperative is to raise shareholder value, and that's... Um, a habitable planet isn't factored into shareholder value. So no matter how responsible you are as a CEO or as you see yourself in Branson's case, yes. your actions are determined by profitability, you, by the ability to use work as cheaply and use natural resources cheaply to generate surplus revenues. And you're under continuous competitive pressure to reinvest. And that pressure forces you to, to exploit workers and to exploit nature because both of those are costs to the business. So capitalism in this sense is a system that's entirely future blind. It can and will, it will sabotage its own conditions of possibility in its drive to accumulate. Um, here's a quote on this from a, a, a <coughs> Dutch astronomer, I think he was, and, and communist of the early 20th century, Anton Panekoek, he puts the point. Um, quite well. Natural resources in this system are nothing but gold. And nature is here to serve capital, not to serve humanity, to serve the appetite for gold. And so this pushes businesses to rely on fossil fuels, for they are quite cheap. And vast infrastructures, above all, have been built around them. So what are the alternatives then? Well, uh, the one in the one that's um, got a real head of steam um, uh, at the moment is the Green New Deal, which uh, refers actually to lots of different types of initiatives. Um, uh, it's a big tent, the Green New Deal. Um, most impressive, a big step forward was taken in this regard at the Labour Party conference uh, just last month, I think it was, where 128 con constituency Labour Party branches Backed a very radical Green New Deal motion. Um, it was by far the most popular motion on the conference floor, and many unions backed it as well. The Fire Brigades Union, the Communication Workers. Uh, it was radical enough that it declared it advanced a decarbonisation of the British economy target by 2030. Acceptance of climate refugees. It called for the rich to be soaked. Um, it was all in all a very inspiring moment, I think, and, and the fact that it came about was, I think it was surely in part because of the pressure from the streets, from the school strikers, from Extinction Rebellion, 
and so on. And it has given a glimpse of some of the kinds of possibilities of policies that are needed to be implemented very rapidly. There was also a commitment to nationalizing the fossil fuel industries, which doesn't guarantee <laughs> that, they, that the oil taps are switched off, but um, is a first step to be able to shut them down. Um, but also it was a motion generally geared towards increase, towards investments, and so the part of the motion that called for an end to airport expansion was nixed by, by a couple of the big unions, the GMB uh, backed by Unite, um, which isn't to say that there isn't a great deal of debate within those unions, there is, but the leadership are very conservative on this point. And up to a point, of course, the emphasis on growth is understandable because uh, a transition to a carbon-free economy uh, worldwide is going to be a massive, comprehensive transition in all spheres of life, housing, energy, work, transport, and so on. It's going to mean colossal investments. Um, now, there will be room for improving the quality of everyone's life even as emissions plummet. The world could be sustainably fed and clothed and housed several times over. Um, but how would a Green New Deal affect the overall materials energy <coughs> envelope? What are the effects going to be on the air and the soil and the seas? Um, take, for example, high-speed rail. Um, it's, I think, you know, certainly rail, rail track should be expanded around uh, this country and around the world, um, and in many ways, high-speed rail is an attractive proposal and a rational one, but uh, we, I think we need to look at these uh, things in some details. For example, if you look at the United States, where the Green New Dealer is there advocating high-speed rail to connect up all the major cities of America, let's say that's the cities over the size of New Orleans, that's about 50 cities in the States, add up all the links between them, whatever connections you draw, whatever the network topology, it's going to be an awful lot of track. And look, if you extend that to the rest of the world, everybody deserves prosperity at the level of the United States. So this guy, the people in Salvador need to get rapidly to events in Manaus, uh, the Muscovite to Omsk, and so on, repeated around the world. Well, where are you going to extract all the materials required for this colossal construction project? Can you do it without burning the planet to a crisp? Maybe you can. Um, but you could reach a stage where so much cement has been manufactured for these projects and so much iron ore dug, dug up for them um, uh, that the recent breakneck expansion of materials use in, for example, China might look like in comparison an after dinner burp. After coal, oil, and gas, own concrete is the greatest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and even for the planned 100 miles of high-speed tr track in, in England, uh, from London to Birmingham or whatever, um, it's going to take 20 million tons of concrete. And to, if you produce one ton of concrete, the same tonnage of, uh, <laughs> of carbon dioxide. Um, Got it. Can we just pull it just to sure, 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 sure. Anyway, I'm speaking so fast anyway, so of course it's probably a good thing. Thank you. By, by one estimate, concrete already outweighs the combined mass of every tree, bush, and shrub on the planet. Um, and so I think we should add to that because we're going to have to, but um, it does give cause for thought. It's all very well saying that all of this will be powered by renewables, but again, look at the figures, add them up. Wind, I, you know, I indicated before, 1.5% of total global final energy supply, so the total energy demand is rising quickly. Um, perhaps we could, perhaps massive trade union and state-backed campaigns for renewable energies and local initiatives could overcome this. We could carpet the world with wind farms and maybe, probably, we should, but you, we need also to bear in mind that turbines, although they are powered by thin air, they're not made, by <coughs> thin, made of thin air, they're made of concrete, steel, copper, glass fiber, neodymium, and so on, and all sorts of composites, all of which require human labor, and at least for now, they require a lot of fossil energy to mine, and, and in order for the mining and the manufacturing and the transport of all of this stuff. And some of these processes, especially 
neodymium mining are incredibly polluted, uh, with mines surrounded by toxic lakes, with workers in the neighborhoods suffering a lot. And so there's pause for thought for, for those reasons, I think. Um, and similar applies to electric vehicles in many countries around the world, like Germany and the United States. If you include the production and the extraction of metals and lithium to make the electric vehicles, as you have to include, um, they emit roughly similar levels of greenhouse gas emissions over their life cycle to <coughs> petrol-fueled cars. I mean, it depends on the energy mix in, of the electricity you're feeding into your car. But um, anyway, it's, it's, not a, not, it's not some magic solution. So in a lot of discussion in the Green New Deal, there's quite a tendency to place faith in technology and blanking out some of these problematic areas that I've been um, raising. There's a conundrum, generally, I think, in, in uh, how we view technology, because, because on the one hand, in any green transition, any transition towards a decarbonized society, technological applications and innovations are going to be absolutely crucial, obviously. However, on the other hand, a, a central defining ideology of capitalist societies is technological fetishism. It, where does it arise from? It arises from the role of innovation in enabling capitals to steal a march on their rivals and gain super profits, technological rents. Um, so for individual businesses, innovation, technological innovation is the elixir of success. And also in general for capital accumulation, um, there's an emphasis on the, that there's a need for continual novelty New products, new product lines, industries line up to persuade us that we need the latest gadget, uh, and if we don't have it, we can't play a full part in social life, and so on. So here's the puzzle. When, when is the green enthusiasm for technology simply a manifestation of technological fetishism? Is the electric car, the enthusiasm for the electric car, is it a necessary element in any green revolution? Or is it just another case of, you know, developing new product lines so that we have to junk our existing models, purchase new ones to keep the wheels of accumulation spinning faster and faster, and then someone will uh, invent uh, an electric car that's a bit more efficient, so we have to get rid of the ones that we have to get the new one, and so on. Which is it? On the political left, technological fetishism and the idea of green growth, they ally together with the politics of class coalition, really, the emphasis being on strategies that the, the majority of the capitalist class can support, strategies that are premised on the profit system, on the accumulation system, on the growth imperative. So is then degrowth the alternative? Well, it's much more of a minority strand um, as compared to the Green New Deal idea. Uh, the Green New Deal covers a lot of political spectrum, but it if it has a dominant complexion, it's social democratic. Degrowthers are also quite very, very motley, um, include all sorts of different people, but if, if it has a center of gravity, it's politically, it's, it's Narodnik. That's the, um, that's the, Naro the, the Narodniks were the Russian student movement uh, who were committed to a sort of ideology of ascetic self-sacrifice and, and geared to rural society and the peasant. Anyway, Green New Deal and degrowth are assumed to be antithetical projects. And I think they're not. Uh, or put it in the, well, more precisely, I should, be, I should be more precise. The main body of each movement is by definition antithetical. Most Green New Dealers are pro-growth, for green growth, and degrowthers are against growth. But at their left flanks, I can see a real convergence there because Degrowth isn't simply a politics of less, as, it's, as the accus accusation sometimes uh, is flung at them. It's more, it's a little bit packed perhaps to say that it's a politics of less is more. So the, in the degrowth society, there'd be a smaller overall materials energy envelope with very differentiated contents. For the rich, much, much less. For the billions who lack the, basic, the basics of decent human life, Sanitation, clean water, better housing, good food, excellent public transport, um, and so on. For the global north, there would be no SUVs, 
hardly any flying, less energy use, less beef, but more self-governed time, cleaner air, better public transport, less hierarchy, and so on. And, but all of this requires major transformations in energy and housing and infrastructures and mobility. Um, and many degrowthers, they campaign for a large-scale expansion of renewable energy, of public transport, passive houses for all, you know, these energy-efficient houses, all of which require large-scale construction programs. And many degrowthers are very committed to strong unions because one of their major uh, uh, demands is for a shorter working week. And you need strong unions to push that through. So I think um, you can see the prospect for an anti-capitalist uh, movement that integrate those, you know, the left of the Green New Dealers and the, the left, uh, the more anti-capitalist degrowthers. Um, if that were to happen, it ha would have to, I think, set as a real forceful target measures to achieve the ending of absolute poverty, the ending of relative poverty, which is absolutely possible politically. Um, in a world of crass gaping inequality, any climate policy that doesn't look to bring about social equality will be, will be dead on arrival. I'll come to an end on this. I've been speaking a bit too long. So degrowthers also call for a reproductive economy of care, understood as care between humans, but also humans and the non-human environment. Um, and in so doing, they resemble those on the far left of the Green New Deal. For instance, there are those in the United States who are arguing for a climate-stable socialism that's oriented toward sustaining and improving human life, I'm quoting, as well as the lives of other species with an emphasis on green collar jobs and pink collar jobs, so in the environmental and um, care work industries. Uh, Elisa Battistoni uh, is one thinker um, advancing these sorts of proposals, Titi Bhattacharya as well. Um, so the point then of struggling for a, a campaigning for a radical Green New Deal one that's quite close to the radical end of the degrowthers, I think, would then be that fossil fuels are rapidly wound down and replaced with renewable energy, but not in order that the air and the wind and the sun are all harnessed again to the process of capital accumulation and economic growth. The point has to be very different to reimagine and redesign society, re-engineer society, including how we work, including social reproduction, our redesign, recraft society around purposes of care and need for human beings and for the planet <coughs> that holds us. That's a quote from um, Tithi's article in Jacobin magazine. Um, I'll leave it there. I mean, I've been speaking too long, so we need time for a discussion. <laughs>